Justine Seymour was the costume designer on the German Netflix miniseries Unorthodox, and I'm Riley Chow, contributing editor at Cold Derby. Now, you've done many interviews about going undercover in Brooklyn, redesigning these tribal hats, uh, as his <laughs> wedding servant, uh, and so forth. So my first question is actually, what were the challenges in designing for someone as tiny as Shira Haas? Well, that is a very good question. Um, she is very, very tiny. Uh, there were many challenges. Um, it was very hard to buy anything that uh, actually off the peg that fit her. So um, what I do in the case of someone like Shearer is I'll, I'll buy what I can find. Um, I did construct quite a few things, but we couldn't build everything for her. So what we did is we bought existing dresses and then we cut them to pieces and then we remade them to fit her uh, fit physique. So um, she is very tiny and the wedding dress was exactly the same. You know, we, we bought a wedding, a really small wedding dress and then took it to pieces and made it even smaller, much, much smaller. So that, that was uh, the only way around it was just really having a fantastic tailor and uh, some of the things I did myself and most of it he did, which was lovely. So you've just been nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Contemporary Costumes. Uh, is the Academy keeping you apprised of uh, how you might possibly accept that award? No, I haven't heard anything. Okay. <laughs> um, I, have, I, have, <laughs> I have no idea how they're going to do it. Um, there's sort of rumblings that there might be um, some sort of get together with the crew that are here in Berlin at the moment. Um, but actually there's nothing solid. Have you heard anything? Yeah, I, I mean, they have announced that this year they're going to put the Emmys across six nights. Uh, so your category is on night five. <laughs> oh, wow, I didn't know that. But yeah, we, we don't really know much beyond that. Uh, so yeah. you recently won the German uh, Television Award. Uh, I saw you post some comments on Instagram about that. But oh, yeah, there it is. I just wanted to ask there it is. how you received it. Uh, what, sorry, what was the question I got? Oh, I, I just wanted to ask world. you about that experience, uh, receiving that award. Uh, you know what? I uh, I got a telephone call from the production designer and she said, you've won it. And she won it as well. Um, and then they actually just put it in the post and sent it to Anna Binger's office. They didn't even contact me personally or anything, which was really, it was the quietest award ever. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of an anticlimax, to be honest, <laughs> but it's a beautiful award, and I'm very proud of it. So, I would have. Re I I know that um, all the parties and everything are are away because of COVID, and it's a shame because it would have been lovely to have actually been able to celebrate. But we couldn't. We didn't. Now, for the Emmys, you've submitted the second episode for consideration. Uh, why select that one? Well, I chose that one because of the wedding. Um, and I just think that the wedding with the magnitude of it has a really nice punch to it. You know, there are there's lots of costumes and everyone looks very much part of that community, which is much more interesting than say, um, you know, the Berlin kids at the nightclub, which was a nice scene, but nothing out of the ordinary. But I think this is a really unique scene. Um, the Satin community have not been uh, put in, uh, represented in a television show before. Um, and there we have 200 people dressed head to toe in Satmar modesty clothing. Um, each dynasty, um, Orthodox Jewish dynasty, has their own set of rules. So that's why I'm referring to the community that we did, um, because it's very specific and everyone was dressed accordingly. Or, as close to as I could get um, to all of those rules. And yeah, that was my favorite episode. What would you say has uh, most impressed you about the way that the Savar community designs their clothes? Like, is there anything that you're taking onto future projects? Look, um, that's a very unusual question. I like the way you think. Um, I really like the fact that when the, the Satma community do get dressed to go out of the house, they actually, uh, they have a dress code. So it's, it's not a uniform, but it, they definitely present themselves in the way that they're supposed to. And I always feel slightly um, saddened by how sloppy a lot of fashion has become, you know, lots of leggings and sweatshirts. And, you know, I'm a designer, so it's, it's dull for me. 
So in that regard, I loved it. I loved that the headscarves were beautiful. I loved that they actually really do wear jewelry out on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Um, I loved the structure of the men's clothing. I, I really like suits and I like the fact that these are long coats and they're called Beckertures. And, um, and then that they actually have a, a vest underneath it. I mean, I like anything that's got a little pomp and ceremony to it. And I find that their clothing um, does celebrate clothing. And it's not just, you know, high street, cheap, comfortable stuff. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, in that second episode, Essie, she goes shopping and she gets this uh, kind of a rainbow scarf. Uh, I wanted to ask about that because I found that quite striking. Okay, that, there was a, a definite thought process behind that, that scarf. Um, it wasn't really rainbow. It kind of had a bit of a, like a 70s feel to it, actually, when you held it up and looked at it. But what I wanted to do as she progressed from her Williamsburg, Satma, modesty clothing into her sort of more newfound self uh, wardrobe. I wanted to drag pieces of the Satma wardrobe through with her so that there wasn't like this crazy, you know, here in Williamsburg, she dresses like that. And now in, now she's in Berlin, she's a totally new person. So the scarf actually was a nod to the fact that all of her family um, that she'd left behind wear headscarves every day on their head. And so I put it around her neck to just, it was just a, a subtle visual nod to the fact that she was breaking away, but breaking away slowly. Can you tell me about dressing Essie's mother, Leah, uh, played by Alex Reed? Yeah, so Alex, um, gorgeous, gorgeous woman. And she uh, obviously had left the community, um, I guess it was in a story about 17 years ago and had very, you know, had 17 years to assimilate and find her feet in Berlin. Um, so I just did her really contemporary, just really casual, um, still a little bit smart. And in fact, when she goes back to Bubby to, to give the papers to SD, I wanted to almost have her be dressed modestly in order to represent the fact that she was still respectful to the community and respectful to Bubby. Um, and then when she goes to the wedding, of course, she wouldn't have got in the door unless she was dressed looking like the other women who were attending the wedding. So um, I put her in that deep purple dress that was very modest. You know, it came right up to her neck, came right down to her wrists, came right below her knees. It has to go five inches below her knees. And of course, wearing the tights, they wear a thick denier tight with a seam up the back um, to let everyone know that that sort of nude color tight or stocking uh, is not flesh. So I put those on her as well because all the other women would have worn them as well. And then we popped, um, I can't remember, did we put a, did the hair and makeup put a wig on her? I, I can't remember if they did, um, sorry a bit long since I've watched it um, and then when she was living her regular life with her girlfriend here in Berlin I just wanted her to look just super casual and just you know contemporary and comfortable within her own skin. Now when Yankee and Moish get to Berlin they put on those baseball caps uh, so what's the story behind those? Um, I think that, I mean, it was scripted, so I just, I just facilitated what the script had said, but I, I, I took it as, you know, it was Orthodox Jews coming back to a place where their community had been basically annihilated um, I was 70 or 80 years ago uh, by the Nazi regime. And I, you know, I feel like they put those hats on just to try and blend in a little bit. Um, and it was sort of to be a little bit incognito, but of course they stood out <laughs> very strongly and looked fantastic. Um, but yeah, I think that's what the thought process was. That's what it was for me anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't use fur in the Strymal hats uh, and you've been recognized by PETA as such, which I imagine must be exciting, extra uh, yeah. as a vegetarian. Uh, what other vegan practices do you use in your designs uh, on this show or any other? Well, you know, I, it's a, it's a, a far stretch. You, you just can't, I mean, I can't be that strict and I'm, I'm, I don't eat veg, I don't eat meat, but I do eat uh, bird and fish. 
so I'm not really strict. Um, I guess I'm more a pescatarian. I hardly ever eat chicken anymore, but sometimes I do. Um, and I, I, it's just really that I didn't want to contribute to the fur industry. Um, there were six, there are six pelts in every single hat that I made and we needed 45 of them. So, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of little animals. And so when the showrunner and the director both said that they would really be happy for me to not get the real things, I mean, I actually couldn't afford them anyway, so I had to come up with a solution. Um, I was really happy that they let me go down that um, sofa line. And from my department, I tried to be as respectful as I could to the community. But when it came to those hats, I you know, I, I had to take a design leap and um, go with the best option. And I actually think they looked really great. When you saw them on mass, they, when I had lacquered them down with the hairspray as much as I did, I thought they looked quite convincing. I, I mean, I'm sure the community knows that they're fake, but um, it's television. Suspension of disbelief. Yeah, I, I think to everyone else, you still think like, oh, wow, look at the detail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. How else does uh, sustainability factor into your designs? Well, um, I really, really love to use secondhand clothing. I love it because it already has had a story. And so whether it's the story of the character that I'm dressing doesn't really matter because we can just coerce it into that. But uh, nearly all of the clothes that I bought for the female Batmar community um, work from secondhand shops. I did masses and masses of thrift shopping here in Berlin. They have these amazing, like four or five story thrift shops. Um, and I would just go in with a, a huge trolley or three, <laughs> and just go in and just pick out the eyes of all of those clothing and just pile them all in. And then we get to the cash register to pay. And the girls behind, the, they just were like, they've never seen anything like it. I mean, I was buying hundreds and hundreds of euros worth of secondhand clothing every time I went and I was doing it two or three times a week um, because I had so many women to dress and all all the lead actresses as well from that community were all secondhand clothing there were a couple of new shirts but hardly any so they what do they call that upcycling um, that's what I do and I really love to do that and I've done it always with my films, as long as I don't need them to have repeat, which means, you know, if they get wet in camera, we need to have a certain number of those in order for the take. So when SD leaves Williamsburg and she's in that initial outfit, of course, that's got a massive story arc within itself. And she arrives in Berlin and then she, you know, listens to the music and then she goes to the Vansy and she gets into the water and bada bing, bada boom, she's soaking wet. Um, so I needed to have, I think I had, I think I had six repeats of that outfit so that we could just keep using it, keep using it and then go in and out of the water and have dry ones for her to put on. So obviously those can't be second hand. Um, but anything that doesn't need a repeat, I really like to use things that are pre-loved and pre-aged. Pre-loved, that's great. Uh, what, what can you tell me about your next project, the Mosquito Coast? Well, um, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful um, adaptation by Neil Cross, who uh, wrote Luther. And I mean, he's fantastic. He's an English writer. Uh, it's got Justin Thoreau in it and Melissa George. And we're on hold because we were shooting in Mexico and um, it, uh, you know, went down with all the other productions when COVID reared its ugly head. So. We're just waiting to see if we can get it back up, which I hope we can, because it's actually a really uh, fun, fast-paced show. Um, quite different from the film that came out in 1986 with Harrison Ford and Helen Merrim. But it's, you know, loosely got something to do with it, but I can't tell you what. <laughs> uh, and finally, I understand that you've been making tens of thousands of masks lately. Uh, can you tell me about that? Personally, I haven't got up to that many. I've made almost 200. Um, okay, I've when, read something. 
<laughs> well, yeah, the union got together and we all, between us all, we made 20,000. So all of the women that can sew that are part of the union in Los Angeles. Um, when I got back to LA from Mexico, uh, the care work, because of course there was, there was no, there was no toilet paper, there were no masks, there was no hand sanitizer, nothing was left. So um, our union asked us to whip out the sewing machines and start uh, sewing them for the people that were giving care to um, people in retirement homes and things like that. Um, they weren't medical grades, but they were better than nothing. So I spent, yeah, I, I think I did that for a whole month and I made quite a lot of very, very colorful masks. <laughs> Justine, well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. And we have many more other unorthodox interviews on our YouTube channel. And please also go to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. Thank you very much for having me. It was delightful meeting you. Mm -hmm.